Hello and welcome back. Today we do our third and last installment on the Bayesian brain and we will review studies on infants which try to show that Bayesian operations are basically wired into the system in young children who have limited experience in the real world but already uh, use Bayesian operations to detect anomalies in their environment and respond accordingly. In the first slide I show you the headline of a paper that appeared this year in Science Magazine Observing the Unexpected Enhances Infants Learning and Exploration. So Bayesian thinking is about detecting anomalies, uh, computing error terms, and utilizing the error terms to prompt and stimulate new learning and acquiring new information which is designed to correct and update the so-called priors which have been down, uh, downloaded and um, ingrained in the uh, neuronal system. So the remarkable finding is that young infants uh, less than a year old are already using um, these kinds of operations and in the next slide we see a uh, summary statement given the overwhelming quantity of information available from the environment how do the very young learners know what to learn about and what to ignore 11 month old infants use violations of prior expectations as special opportunities for learning the infants were shown events that violated expectations about object behavior or events that were nearly identical but did not violate expectations. The sight of an object that violated expectation enhanced learning and promoted information seeking behaviors. Specifically, the infants learned more effectively about objects that committed violations, explored those objects more, and engaged in hypothesis testing behaviors that reflected the particular kind of violation that was seen. And the next slide shows you a depiction of the experimental setup. Now this does not make a lot of sense just looking at it. So in the uh, next segment we will show you a number of videos that the infants have been exposed to which demonstrate the different violations of expectations that for an adult are very easily to uh, identify but which children uh, respond to with uh, surprise and astonishment. Now these are 11 months old infants, how do we know what they're thinking? Well, there's an, a tradition in infant research which utilizes eye gaze and eye fixation as an indirect measure, a proxy, so to speak, for infant's interest and cognitive engagement. So the longer a child looks at an event, the more interested uh, he or she appears to be in what is going on in this particular video. So I will now give you the chance to look at these uh, initial set of videos and as you will see um, they all have to do with violating a certain expectations that we all take for granted in our interactions with the physical world. Look, look at this. Watch this. Look, look at this. Watch this.
Look, look at this. Watch this. Look, look at this. Watch this. Look, look at this. Watch this. Look, look at this. Watch this. Okay, now that you have reviewed the videos, we can now look at the um, depiction of the result of the data. And what this somewhat um, complex data set reveals is that infants confronted with a violation of expectation, something that should not happen in the physical world, uh, see enhanced learning, enhanced engagement with the objects that they observe, and exploration of the object, such as touching it, throwing it around, squishing it, just to see what is really going on with these um, items. This paper is also in your um, ebook as a clinical item uh, that you can study at your leisure in more detail. The next slide, then, in summary, states that these sophisticated behaviors have been interpreted in terms of Bayesian inferences that generate knowledge by weighing new evidence against prior beliefs. And there are two additional references here on the slide that are also included as clickable items in the ebook. So these findings then accord well with such a Bayesian framework and suggest avenues to explore how violations detected in different domains of prior knowledge and using different kinds of new evidence shape exploration and learning throughout the lifespan and across species. We will now move on to a study entitled Pure Reasoning in 12-Month-Old Infants as Probabilistic Inference. And by now you are much aware of uh, the phraseology prob probabilistic inference, of course, speaks directly to uh, Bayesian statistics. So in this study, the objective was to see whether infants' looking times are consistent with the Bayesian ideal observer embodying abstract principles of object motion. So again, it's physics. It's what you expect objects in movement should do. And these models explain infant statistical expectations and classic qualitative findings about object cognition in younger babies. Not originally viewed as probabilistic inferences, but now clearly described as being consistent with those. So here in the next slide you see a depiction of what um, the setup might be to detect unusual events, common sense predictions on pure reasoning. You see tables here with blocks um, arranged on top, yellow and uh, red. And if you jiggle the table, which blocks do you think might fall down in table A, B, C or D? And you can predict the closer a block is to the edge of the table, the more likely it will fall down. In B, the higher the stack of blocks is, the more unstable this construction will be and more likely there will be a catastrophic uh, fall and these pieces will come down. In D, there might be an interaction between the collapsing tower and the red blocks at the periphery that might be pushed down by the collapse of the tower. So this is a typical uh, setup to uh, examine intuitive notions of physics in young children. The next slide gives you a preview of movies which we'll see next. Twelve kinds of movies were generated by manipulating factors relevant to predicting outcomes 
the number of objects in each type in a scene where three instances of one type and one of another type were used, their physical arrangement, and the duration of occlusion. This will make sense uh, once you see the movies. As it turns out, forming correct expectations from these video clips requires the ability to integrate these three information sources guided by abstract knowledge about how objects move. At a minimum, qualitative knowledge about solidity. Objects are unlikely to pass through walls, for example. And spatiotemporal continuity. Objects tend to move short distances over brief time intervals. Infants are sensitive to each of these information sources and knowledge systems individually. So you will now have a chance to review the video clips that these infants were exposed to. Now that you have reviewed the video clips, we can summarize that the infant's reasoning abilities are typically studied by measuring their looking times to visually presented events as an index of surprise. Longer looking times indicate greater violation of infant's expectations relative to the prior knowledge or greater novelty relative to their interpretation of habituation stimuli. Looking time studies suggest that pre-verbal infants can reason about novel events depending on certain physical outcome. Looking time studies suggest then that pre-verbal infants can reason about novel events depending on physical outcomes, object numerosities, a fancy word for how many objects are present, other agents' beliefs, goals and behaviors and the likely outcome of simple random processes. So the test events are fixed and equal and salient so that infants looking times have the potential to show variations in degrees of belief or conversely degrees of surprise as their expectations changed. So an ideal Bayesian observer model that predicts infants' looking times in these studies and extends to other aspects of infant reasoning about the physical world, giving a unifying explanation to classic results in infant cognition. So the model proposed in this paper shows how powerful poor reasoning capacities could derive from the operations of probabilistic inference mechanisms constrained by abstract principles of how objects act and interact over time. You have seen the movie in the next slide here. 
just to remind you, here's the setup of uh, objects in a uh, circle that try to escape through an opening. There are objects of different color and different shape and different numerosities, to use this fancy word. And predictions can be derived as to how likely it is for any one of these objects to escape. And here you see the looking times corresponding to the surprise factor um, as to how likely the outcome was that any particular object was likely to escape through the hole in the wall. Here's a summary slide of the result and you can see that unlikely outcomes engage the infants much more actively and uh, produce longer looking times. So in a plot to test whether a uh, model, a Bayesian model of the uh, expected data in fact matches what infants are doing, you find this rather stunning correlation. The model predictions on the x-axis and infant looking times are almost perfectly correlated. What this means then is that we can analyze the experimental setup in terms of Bayesian expectations and statistics and see whether infants perform accordingly. And the perfect match here would indicate that infants, not knowing anything about Bayesian statistics, are in fact implementing the same in the way they reasoned about probabilistic events. So this aspect concludes the section on infants. Um, the implications of this are that our brains are designed from birth or very early childhood to implement Bayesian approaches in evaluating what's going on in the world and comparing um, stimuli with what we have laid down in our neuronal circuitry as so-called priors. Now let's move forward and see if we can use this kind of information that's wired in our neurons in terms of uh, some psychiatric issues. Okay, so this paper here uh, in Nature Reviews of Neuroscience reviews a number of intriguing studies that attempt to explain the so-called positive symptoms of schizophrenia, such as hallucinations, in terms of a Bayesian approach. In prior lectures, I um, explained to you that the Bayesian approach has this dramatic advantage of decreasing bandwidth by detecting error terms and propagating those error terms rather than the entire raw data set that comes in every second into your sensory apparatus. Now, the system is only as good as the error detection and the precision of the error detection. So a theory now has been constructed that perhaps in schizophrenic patients the error term calculation is imprecise, distorted, and reverberates through the system and has certain consequences that can be predicted as positive symptoms of schizophrenia. In the next slide, just to remind you of uh, the computation of prediction error, so dopamine, uh, we have discussed already, is involved critically in the calculation of predicted award and received award. Learning, then, is proportional to the prediction error. You can see here on the right side of the slide a sketch of the dopamine system, which comes in a variety of forms. There's the uh, nigrostriatal system, primarily involved in uh, computing movement, and there is the um, system uh, from the periaqueductal peri peri grain, the ventral tegmental area, which projects widely into the frontal lobes, where, where important um, computations are taking place with regard to assigning value and um, making predictions about what one should buy, should not buy, what one should value, and what one should bypass. 
On the left side of the slide, you see the um, flow sheet. Um, an error signal is generated. This will modify current connectivity and result in a change in behavior. Or, if not, the error term will be maintained. In the next slide, we see a more detailed anatomical presentation of those networks that are critically involved in the so-called valuation network. So these are regions of the substantia nigra, the ventral tegmental area, which send projections to specific areas in the ventral striatum, particularly the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is really the engine that drives uh, desire and uh, pleasure derived from stuff we buy and stuff we would like to have and uh, pursue. And then we have the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the medial orbital frontal cortex, which are uh, critically involved in a more detailed and refined assign assignment of value and preference. In the next slide, I want to talk you through um, the theory that underlies this approach. Um, it turns out that um, most people spend their time with the idea in mind that they have a very accurate representation of the world. Actually, evidence suggests that we are all rather poor in letting our sensory experience update our beliefs, and that we are all susceptible to prior beliefs and social constraints that limit our ability to deal with evidence rationally. Just look at uh, our political process and the um, uh, election process that is in place right now, and you will be convinced uh, of the correctness of my statement. For most of us, this may be manifest as poor performance when we try to deal with probabilities or as vulnerability to biases as we try to model the world. For the most part, people do not depart from the beliefs of the herd. So, the dopamine neuron, as we discussed, the firing patterns encode the precision or uncertainty of prediction errors and this precision weights the influence of prediction errors or inference. This is crucial for optimizing the balance between top-down prior beliefs and bottom-up sensory evidence. We can speculate on the impact of abnormal dopamine-mediated neuromodulation on prediction errors. It is not the prediction error per se that are faulty, it is the way that they are used and quantified. The size of the prediction error is meaningless without an estimate of precision. So, a noisy prediction error signal would therefore lead to strange experiences. Together with our readiness to accept incidental stimuli and events as important and meaningful, and to link them in unusual ways, the persistence of the disruption up the hierarchy can mean that the attempts of the lower level to explain the world will fail. Achieving a world model that is not continually being signaled as wrong will require more and more complex changes. This may be experienced as the world feeling strange, and there may be a sense that there is some underlying change that must be discovered which is the equivalent of some paranoid ideation looking for connections where there really aren't any. In the next slide, can you see the dark in the slide? Perceptual decisions are those in which the aim of the decision maker is to categorize ambiguous or noisy sensory information. In the next slide is a study summarized in which it was shown that in schizophrenic patients there's evidence for abnormal neural correlates of prediction errors. So in fact, um, this may be a mechanism that is a fruitful way of investigating the, the mechanics of auditory hallucinations and faulty beliefs in schizophrenia. Another study uh, in a brain 
in 2007 found a similar result. And here is a compilation of both papers side by side, which shows a comparison of controls of pa and patients uh, in terms of uh, abnormal responses to either a financially salient reward, that is um, a f 50 cents or one dollar for a correct choice, or on the right hand side um, a causal inference task that constituted either a violation or fulfillment of a previously learned causal association. What this slide shows is that in both studies, using both approaches, either saliency or causal inference, patients can be differentiated from controls in the way they respond, and this can be mapped to the ventrotic mental area, in other words, to the dopamine system being involved in faulty error processing and the imprecision of error detection. The next slide shows um, another way to conceptualize this. Uh, here is the EEG study of connectivity in different brain regions in both normal controls and in the lower panel patients with schizophrenia. And as you can see, uh, schizophrenic patients um, have different coherence areas of the brain far distant from each other show an altered connectivity or wiring pattern in patients rather than controls. This of course will reverberate in terms of how information is processed. So here again you see the dog on the right hand side. Well it's not the dog really, it's a baby. Here you see the infant in a beautiful color photo and here's an abstraction, a black and white um, reductive presentation of the same image, which now is a very ambiguous stimulus. It turns out that schizophrenic patients and patients predisposed to schizophrenia, patients who have a condition called schizotypy, which is perhaps a precursor of the illness, have an advantage over normal controls in decoding these kinds of ambiguous stimuli. So you may have a hard time seeing the infant's face on the right hand side here. Uh, patients with schizotypy uh, or patients in the early stages of schizophrenia are much better in doing so. And the reason is that they rely more on prior knowledge. So having been exposed to the picture of the infant they are much more adept in decoding an ambiguous presentation of the same image with a much faster time frame. So this is one of the rare findings in which patients with a mental illness have a advantage over normal controls in terms of information processing. So these were unmedicated patients that did not meet the criteria for schizophrenia but were perhaps in early psychosis. And in that situation, there's a shift in information processing favoring prior knowledge. Furthermore, the degree of psychosis proneness in healthy individuals, and specifically the presence of subtle perceptual alterations, is also associated with a stronger reliance on prior knowledge. And here's a presentation of this. Um, this maps the performance benefit, in other words, how much better patients with schizotypy or schizophrenia are in detecting ambiguous stimuli, uh, plotted against their um, perceptual schizotypy or their belief-related schizotypy. Now, these are scales um, that are in the literature. We don't need to bother about the details right now, just to say that um, either perception or belief uh, distortions um, correlate extremely well with an advantage in the belief and priors affording 
these individuals an advantage in detecting ambiguous stimuli with higher accuracy. So there's a price to be paid uh, by being more efficient in decoding ambiguous stimuli in terms of being wedded to notions that may not be adaptive in the current situation. To summarize, these findings are striking because in a clinical group, given that performance in this group, as in psychiatrically ill individuals more generally, is typically impaired, such a result is rare and is revealing in that the highlights that it highlights a specific information processing atypicality rather than a general performance deficit. In this experiment, this shift conferred a performance benefit. Under most natural viewing conditions, it may provoke anomalous perceptual experiences. Specifically, it might impose prior expectations on inputs to the extent that ultimately formed percepts are generated that have no direct sensory cause. And those, of course, are hallucinations. So here you have another example of how Bayesian statistics and um, experiments utilizing this approach can generate a hypothesis that may be able to afford an explanation for a very puzzling clinical phenomenon, in this case, delusional beliefs and hallucinations. We have encountered a similar phenomenon in a prior lecture where we have seen that the odd bidirectional uh, relationship of depression and physical illness, such as arthritis, hypertension, diabetes, and other conditions, um, can be approached by invoking a Bayesian mechanism that connects uh, the um, agranular cortices of the cingulate cortex, for example, with the insula, and um, hypothesizing that an error term is being generated, which eventually overwhelms the system, leading to both uh, changes in the HBA axis and the resulting medical problems, but also in behaviors that correlate and uh, the, the matrix for depression. So this is a very gratifying way of looking at the brain and psychiatry because a almost mathematical model, a probabilistic model, can be invoked as being neuronally implemented already in infants 11 months old, and that the same mechanistic approach can be used to explain very strange psychiatric phenomena that otherwise are suspended in thin air without much to hang them on. So this was an overview over Bayesian statistics and how this powerful tool might be used in the future to refine the studies uh, in psychiatry. Again, we welcome your feedback on uh, these presentations and are open to suggestions please contact us at uh, behavioralhealth2000.com. Thank you very much for your attention, and we'll see you soon again.